we could have the screen. We invite your attention to Daniel chapter 2. We look today to verses 31 through 45 as we continue our series on God and the nations. Now the background to this is that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. It was a very frightening dream. He called in all of his soothsayers and uh, the Chaldeans and all of his wise men. And he basically said, tell me the dream and tell me the interpretation. They said, we can't tell you the interpretation until we know the dream. And he says, if you're really who you say you are, you can tell me what the dream is. And if you don't, I'm going to kill you. Uh, <clears throat> That's a strong incentive to either come up with something or pack up and leave town in the dead of night. And with that in mind, uh, they couldn't do it. The king issued a decree that these wise men should die. And Daniel, being supported by God, uh, basically was given the dream and its interpretation. And so we pick that up then at verse 31, where he says to Nebuchadnezzar, you, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue. The statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and in appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet and clay of iron and clay and crushed them. And then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed, all at the same time, and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell its interpretation before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand and has caused you to rule over them all. You are the head of gold. After you, there will arise another kingdom inferior to you, then another third kingdom of bronze, bronze, which will rule over the earth. Then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things. So like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces. In that you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom, but it will have in it the toughness of iron, inasmuch as you saw iron mixed with common clay. As the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, to some, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put to an end all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to you, the king, what will take place in the future. So the dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. Have you ever read that passage and sat down to try to envision in your mind's eye what that statue looked like, what that image looked like? It's a pretty awesome image, is it not? And it fills the bill. It's better than some TV programs. And uh, by the time you look at some of the images that you have here in Daniel in the book of Revelation, you don't need to watch any kind of a scary movie. All you need to do is take a look at what is going on in the Bible. And the nice thing about it is it's not fiction, it's truth. 
And God gave to Nebuchadnezzar a dream. And he gave a dream that goes for time and for eternity. And it's vital then that we know what that dream is about. Because it has to do with our lives. It has to do with the history of the world. We want to look at the source of the dream. We want to look at the purpose of the dream, the substance of the dream, and the significance of the dream. And by the time it's through, we will have taken a rather sharp prophetic course in the history of the Near East and of Western European nations. So let's look then at the source of the dream. Daniel said, let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. Notice that from the very outset, what we are going to see in the source of this dream is ultimately the purpose of God, which we will talk about in a moment. But notice that the dream itself, it comes from him who is the fountainhead of wisdom and power. This is not just a dream that keeps people occupied. It's not just a dream that keeps people wondering what they had to eat the night before. It is God communicating his mind and his will to Nebuchadnezzar. We are reminded that the scriptures say that God allowed the nations to go their own way, but he was never without a witness. He was never without a testimony. We are told that he gave good harvest seasons, that their hearts might be gladdened. But he also confronted them by way of conscience and by way of revelation, that they might know that there is a true and a living God who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And therefore, as Daniel said, let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. This is a strong argument for humility, for wisdom and strength, Wisdom and power do not come from ourselves. It comes from the Lord, whether we're speaking corporately or individually. And Daniel goes on to say that it is he who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and he establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. I think that once again, we should keep this verse well in mind. We see changes going on all over the world. We don't know what the outcome will be, at least in the near run. We know what the outcome will be in the long run. We see that there are plenty of questions in our own nation. Some people say we are now going in a different direction. Other people say we should be going in a different direction. The others say we should reverse course, and it is a time of question. But what should not be a question for you and me and brothers and sisters the world over is this, that God is the one who changes the times. He changes the epochs of history. He removes kings and he establishes kings. He gives wisdom and knowledge to wise men. And of course, the biblical understanding of wisdom is that it begins with the fear of the Lord, a trust in him and a trust in the revelation that he has given to us, not only by way of nature, but most importantly, by way of the word of God. That he is the source of all knowledge. He is the source of power. He is indeed the author of history. And that leads us to the purpose of this dream as well. Notice that Daniel goes on to say, However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. This was your dream and the visions in your mind while you were on your bed. Notice that the purpose of the dream is to make the future known to Nebuchadnezzar. But it goes on, and it's more than that, than just making the future known. And we should understand this most clearly. The purpose was to have Nebuchadnezzar know that he is subject to the sovereign God. The king answered Daniel and said, Surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, since you have been able to reveal this mystery. It seems like all of my life there's been an outpouring, at least from time to time, of some kind of a prophetic statement, some kind of prophetic uh, 
indication that the Antichrist will be here soon. He's already here. He will soon be revealed. All kinds of things are happening. But understand that the point of prophecy is not to pick our interest about the future. It's not supposed to give us a leg up on what is going to happen in the history and the events of mankind. The purpose of prophecy is one thing and one thing only. It is to put our attention back upon God and who he is and why he does what he does. Prophecy is twofold. It is foretelling the mind and the will of God, and it is foretelling his mind and his will. And it is not our purpose, it is not our calling as believers to start trying to say, this is how it's going to be a year from now, a year and a half from now, an hour from now, for that matter. The purpose of prophecy is for God to reveal himself in all of his fullness, in his glory in his power, and in his majesty. And notice that at this point, at least, Nebuchadnezzar has the picture. The king answered Daniel and said, Surely your God is a God of gods, and he is the Lord of kings, and he is a revealer of mysteries, since you have been able to reveal this mystery. He has sovereignty, and this is the issue in this passage. He has sovereignty over all of the rulers of mankind. And he is the source of knowledge. He is the source of wisdom. And you and I as believers should never lose sight of that fact. And we should never let prophecy turn into a circus. This should be the very ground for our praise and adoration to him who is the glorious Lord of all. We've seen the source of the dream. We've seen the purpose of the dream. Notice the substance of the dream in 231. You, O king... We're looking, and behold, there was a single great statue, that statue which was large and of extraordinary splendor was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. I have a hard time remembering to give titles to my sermons, but if I were to give a title to this sermon, I would call it In Your Face, because that's exactly what's happening to Daniel, uh, rather to Nebuchadnezzar. He has this dream and here's this overwhelming image and it's in his face. It's big, it's overwhelming, and it's staring at him. Notice that it was singular. The idea being that it was commanding. It commanded the king's attention. And it was massive in size. It was great in size. And it was extraordinarily bright. One commentator even called it dazzling. I haven't found an image of the statue or, or an image that uh, goes beyond what, I, what you see here on the screen. I wish I could find one that was dazzling, that had the light just almost flashing, because that was a part of the picture that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. It was extraordinarily bright, and when it says awesome, It was even more than awesome. The term can also mean terrifying. Here is one who has been a genius in military maneuvers. Here is one in just a few years' time has revived the old Babylonian Empire. Here is the one who defeated the Egyptian king in southern Turkey and sent him back to Egypt. Here is the one who has tacked down Assyria. He's tacked down Palestine. All of... The Mesopotamian area belongs to him. Of the kingdoms to follow, this will be the smallest. Of the kingdoms to follow, this will be the smallest in terms of length of time and in terms of area covered. But in terms of sheer and absolute authority and control, this is the purest one. Notice its human features. We notice the head. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, not just gold, but fine gold. Its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. We are looking at a human, but we are looking at one that is superhuman because we are also looking at one that represents not only authority and sovereignty, but also the kingdoms that are generated by the authority and sustained by the authority and expanded by that authority. 
Notice the action. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. All of a sudden, here is this overwhelming statue, this overwhelming image. If it could move, it would be bending over, looking down at the king. And in the flash, in an instant, it is destroyed. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on the feet, and it crushed them. The imposing, overwhelming statue is attacked. It is attacked by a superior power. It is attacked by a supernatural power. And the attack crushed the feet of the statue. And in fact, notice the attack totally destroyed the statue. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, I know a good number of you here are students of the book of Daniel, and I don't need, in fact, I am relying on some of your knowledge as I leave some things out. But notice that all of those kingdoms and empires, we find them only in the history books. They're found in the archives, but you don't see them anymore as they were. Rome, Rome will still exist in the Western European nations, but notice all of this that was predicted in some instances centuries in advance have taken place already. The image is gone. The attack totally destroyed human sovereignty, and the stone became a mountain that filled the earth and the term mountain is usually a term that speaks of government. Here is a stone, uncut, reminds us of that one who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, buried, resurrected on the third day and ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand of God the Father. And from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. This is that stone that was uncut. And this was that stone who did away with human sovereignty, who did away with the kingdoms and the empires, and was the one who ultimately filled the earth with a new sovereignty, a sovereignty that is not rapacious, a sovereignty that is not beastly and brutal, a sovereignty that is truly just and also compassionate. And that leads us then to the significance of the dream. You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the God of heavens has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand and has caused you to rule over them all. You are the head of gold. Notice that the head of gold represents Nebuchadnezzar and the revived Babylonian Empire. He is the total sovereign. He is the king of kings. And wherever there are human beings, he rules them. And you say, but pastor, his kingdom is limited. Yes, it is, but in his time, he still exercised authority beyond the bounds of the kingdom. He still kept Egypt in check. He still kept others in check. And he is the total sovereign. His rule is the standard for total sovereignty. Every other empire that is to rise up is to rise up and try to conform to the life and to the standard of Nebuchadnezzar. Notice that his word is law, it is unchallenged, and it is unfettered. O king, the most high granted sovereignty, grant your glory and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father. He's speaking to Belshazzar. The kingdom is coming to an end this very night. 
And he says, because of the grandeur which he bestowed on him, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language feared and trembled before him. Whomever he wished, he killed. And whomever he wished, he spared alive. And whomever he wished, he elevated. And whoever he wished, he humbled. Notice, he didn't have to consult with anybody if he didn't want to. He said, this proposition A, this will stand. Fifteen seconds later, he says, I don't want proposition A to stand. I want proposition B to stand. He didn't have to get permission from anyone. He was the unchallenged and unfettered sovereign of the kingdom. He was the dictator par excellence. He was the standard by which all other dictators would try to rise. And notice that grandeur and everything that he had ultimately was a gift from God. And he was held responsible for it as well, as you know, in the next vision to follow. So in terms of sovereignty then, the second kingdom will be inferior to the first as the third will be inferior to the second as well as the first. And the second kingdom is the Medo-Persian Empire and the third is the Greek Empire. And notice that the inferiority looks toward sovereign authority. By the, the Medo-Persians established something new. It was called the law of the Medo-Persian Empire. Even the king had to obey the law. He couldn't be a Nebuchadnezzar even if he wanted to be. By the time we come to Greece, even though there was this tremendous empire, still at its root, we begin to see a republic democracy. We see people being able to voice their opinion and to state their will. And we see that again in Rome. But what we also see is a weakening of political strength and governmental strength. And the fourth empire, it has a great and mighty military. Then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron. Inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things, so like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces. The remnant of all of the empires that came before would be decimated, and Rome would rule. And Rome would rule from 169 to at least, depending on where you want to call it a halt. The empire finally split, it seems to me, when the east was defeated in about 376, the Battle of Adrianople, when the east was thoroughly trounced. But still, the empire existed. And some say that the empire exists today in the European countries, not necessarily in terms of their power, but at least in terms of their culture. The sovereignty and the power to rule is the weakest and it is the most inferior. And then we look at the coming of the fifth empire. As the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, and they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as the iron does not combine with pottery. But notice that in the days, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put to an end all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. As the kingdoms and the empires come and go, as they go their way, they come and they go at the behest of God, who someday will say, this is the end, now comes the kingdom of my son, and it will crush the kingdom of this world. And you and I as believers should keep this in mind. We should keep in mind that the salvation that we talk about actually extends to culture and to government. 
And notice that in the life of Daniel, in the life and the ministry of Daniel, he would even call Nebuchadnezzar to a point of repentance. And we see the Apostle Paul when he was being held under arrest. He didn't mind telling Festus, I think it was, no, Felix, that he better live righteously and rule righteously. That we have an interest in these things as believers. I do not think that we should have an interest to the point that we become something of a governmental structure, but we should speak of the righteousness and the justice that comes from God, that's implanted by God into the hearts and the consciences of every person and to whom every person will be held accountable. And notice that this should be our hope, that we have a hope of the coming of the kingdom. Oftentimes we speak of the hope of going to heaven, but God has a hopeful outcome for his creation. He has a hopeful outcome that he calls the new heaven and the new earth where righteousness dwells. And he calls us to be men and women who represent those attributes and those characteristics. And we should speak of the hope of the future, which is more than just going to heaven. It's been a couple of years now since I met a sociology teacher, and he was really in the depths of despair. He was worried about the overpopulation of the earth by species human being. And he didn't know what to do about it. And he was really grieving over it. And of course, I being prone to comfort in the most comfortable, comforting ways, said, don't worry about it. We'll have a few big wars and that'll solve the problem. It's like just trimming the trees. And he gave me this blank look. But I was trying to bring out a point that his situation would in fact be hopeless apart from the resurrected and returning Lord. And this is the thing that we keep in mind, that he is the king. Notice, for example, unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. If you study that image, notice how massive it is. And notice that its foundation is insufficient. The feet are weak. They're mixed with clay and with iron. And clay and iron will not adhere. So here is this massive image. And it speaks of sovereignty and great power. But it is, in effect, the Achilles heel. And the image's foundation speaks of insufficiency, causing the empire to collapse into chaos. Even if the rock did not come to hit it, it eventually would. And should the Lord not intervene, the entire human race would be annihilated. Therefore, we understand his judicial act to be mingled with mercy and grace. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. But for the sake of the people of God, those who have committed their lives to him in faith, these are his chosen ones. Those who are willing to entrust their lives to him. And it's for their sake that this is done. And that means that we should be filled with hope and we should be filled with joy even now. For we see exactly the triumphal hymns, hymn of praise in Revelation chapter 11. It sounds like a done deal. The seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. The Muslims have their view of this. They have Isa coming. Hitler looked for the Uberman, the Overman who was to come. He thought for himself that he was the one, but he was wrong. And there will be many antichrists and many false Christs along the way. 
But we do not worry because the kingdom is his. And the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. Which brings us back to the very personal element in all of this. And this probably is the point that Daniel would use at Belshazzar and that Nebuchadnezzar at least got the idea even if he didn't embrace. So that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Notice every knee will bow. And it seems to me they will bow either in triumph or in defeat. They will bow to the one who has become their Lord and their Savior. Or they will bow as a part of the vanquished. And today is indeed the day where people have the opportunity to be sure that they have bowed the knee to Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and at the same time can say, this is my personal Lord and Savior. For that day is not forever. But notice that our God is the God of history. Our Lord is the Lord of lords. He is the King of kings. And we don't just accept him as Savior. We confess him as Lord. And even when we pray, what is our prayer? Thy will be done. And this is the way of the life of faith put into the hands of Jesus Christ the King. Our Father, as we come to you in prayer, we look at these things and they're really amazing as we read them. But when we read these things and we have some history books at our side, we see that this is not mere fantasy, that this is not just a dream. This is the statement of reality as it is and as it will be. Because you are the Alpha and the Omega, you are the beginning and the end. All things come from you, they are sustained by you, and they go back to you. And you know the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning, because you are the author. And we thank you for giving to us Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our King, in whose name we do pray. Amen.